become a patron of Myth Vision Podcast, get access to everything early, help us grow. Ian Mills, New Testament Review Podcast. Thank mm-hmm. you so much for joining me again today, brother. I appreciate it. Of course. Go down in that description. Make sure you guys subscribe to his YouTube channel. Join his Patreon. And, of course, as usual, interesting conversation. Marking priority. Yes. Is in, dude, you love this stuff. I do. Who do who taught you? Well, well actually, <laughs> Mark Kudaker is my PhD uh, advisor, my doctor, father, my mentor. Although I have to say, I learned marking priority not from him, but from Melissa Selu at the University of Minnesota. Okay. Um, who was a member of the Jesus Seminar uh, and a very, very different scholar, a uh, Q believer. <laughs> why is it important though? I mean, what yeah. is mark and priority and why does it matter? Mark and priority is probably the least controversial claim in New Testament scholarship. Um, it is the... It is the one thing that you'll find that more than almost anything else, people who study the Gospels all agree about this, whatever else they might disagree about. Um, and it's, it's really, really interesting. And it's a thing that really, really transforms how we can read the Gospels and really transforms um, our interpretation of the Gospels. And uh, so I think it's a really, really important thing. And it's, it's, it's weird because this has been taught at seminaries for a hundred years now. Everyone has been learning this thing. Um, and for some reason, it often doesn't leave the seminary doors. It gets left and doesn't make its way into the pews. Um, so it's a, it's a hugely important thing that is really not controversial in scholarship and has been established on all sorts of lines of evidence um, as, you know, as close to we get, as close as we can get to a consensus uh, mm. in New Testament studies. And that is that Mark, of the gospels that survive, Mark was the first gospel written. And Matthew and Luke used Mark in writing their Gospels. So there's two parts to that claim. That there is a literary relationship. There is a literary dependence of Matthew and Luke on Mark with a documentary solution. That is, um, they were not just hearing the teachings of Jesus and writing it down in similar ways, but that Matthew and Luke were actually reading a copy of Mark. And, of course, then there's also the direction of dependence. So those things combined, we call mark and priority. Let's do the literary relationship and documentary evidence first, evidence for a documentary solution first, which is quite simple. Uh, 660 verses in Mark, 600 of them are taken over. The wording is taken over into Matthew. Hmm. 90% of Mark shows up, of Mark's words show up in Matthew. It's actually 77% of the actual, you know, actual word gets pulled over because, of course, Matthew sometimes substitutes a synonym. Okay. Um, but uh, of the verses, 90% of them get carried over. And that includes 30 word verbatim strings of agreement. Word for word for 30 words, exactly the same word. That doesn't happen by chance. Does not happen by chance. Jesus didn't speak in Greek. These gospels are being written in Greek. Greek doesn't care about word order. They're copying over the same words in the same order um, in ex- for huge strings of agreement. Imagine describing the same, you and your friend are describing the same story, even if you were both there, even if you've talked about it beforehand, you are still not going to have 30 word strings of verbatim agreement, especially if you're describing this in another language. Jesus preached in Aramaic. <laughs> Moreover, it's not just the teachings of Jesus. It's not like they're just drawing on a common store of teachings of Jesus. It's also descriptions of the setting. It's also descriptions of what scriptures they're quoting to contextualize the the story. Um, And in the case of Mark and Matthew, uh, they even both reproduce the same editorial interjection. In the Synoptic Apocalypse, where Jesus is talking about the stars falling from heaven, um, there is... A place where Mark steps in and says, let the reader understand. He's, he's interjecting a little editorial comment and saying, pay attention here. Matthew copies it over verbatim. Matthew copies the whole sentence out. Um, actually, he adds in a little phrase. Um, uh, on, on the Sabbath is the phrase he adds in. And then he copies, over, uh, he copies over the editorial interjection. Let the reader understand. So, literary solution is not controversial. Um, their documentary solution is not controversial. There's some controversy over how this happened. I, I'm 
a big part of my dissertation is actually compositional methods in the first century. So there's, there's debates over whether or not Matthew had eyes and a copy of Mark. Matthew was having Mark dictated to him by a lector, by a reader, or Matthew was memorizing swaths and then copying it over. People can disagree about that. That's fine. I'm not going to come out in favor of one solution or another at this point. Um, but it's dependent on Mark as a written text. But why not opposite direction, right? Why not? Why are scholars so convinced that uh, Matthew is reading Mark and not Mark reading Matthew? Right. Bunch of different lines of interpretation. There uh, are a bunch of different lines of argument favor this solution. Um, one is the, the, the redaction profile of the evangelists, which is to say, what kind of person is Mark if he's reading Matthew versus what kind of person is Matthew if he's reading Mark? Seems a little bit weird, but let me explain what I mean. Uh, Mark, if Mark is copying out of Matthew, what changes does he make? He deletes, omits the nativity, the, the miraculous birth of Jesus. He omits, deletes the resurrection accounts. He takes Jesus saying, I won't heal you because you lack faith and says, I cannot heal you because you lack faith. He takes Jesus healing people at a word with distance and says, no, Jesus had to do that twice. And Jesus had to use mud and spit. He takes the Lord's Prayer, which we know, if looking around, this is an argument from Mark Goodacre, that if you look around, all the different components of the Lord's Prayer correspond to Mark's own conception of who Jesus is. These are all fit into Mark's portrayal of Jesus. But he deletes it. The image you get of Matthew, sorry, the image you get of Mark as a reader of Matthew, as someone who's rewriting Matthew, is someone who cuts out the resurrection, cuts out the nativity, and consistently makes Jesus have a little bit of harder time doing miracles. And consistently takes Matthew where Jesus says, um, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, um, call, calls him good teacher. And Jesus says, uh, why do you ask me about the good? And changes it to, why do you call me good? You can see, in contrast, if you flip those, um, if, if Mark is using Matthew, he's someone who seems to be very interested in downplaying how important Jesus is in cutting out the resurrection of Jesus. That's just not a, that's not a plausible portrayal of an early Christian. Um, in contrast, you get a much, if you get Mark composing this material, that is he's received these traditions about the historical of Jesus and he's writing these things up in Greek for the first time, um, you then see, get an image of Matthew is coming along and takes Mark and says, well, Mark knows there's a resurrection. He signals it, right? And he's got these angels signaling to it, but we never get to see it. Um, we should definitely have those traditions. And adds that in. And says, uh, we have Jesus you know, on the scene as a significant person at the baptism, but what about his childhood? We should add that stuff in too. And so you get the image of Matthew as a very plausible, pious uh, person who loves Jesus. And that's just a more plausible depiction of who, uh, who would bother to spend the time writing a gospel. There's other things. I, my favorite additional argument, there's two more arguments that I think are really important, um, and that is the argument against microconflation and the argument for from editorial fatigue. And I'll start with the second one because it's a little more interesting. Um, when authors copy out of sources verbatim, when they do it as conservatively, as uh, carefully as Matthew and Luke copy out of Mark, um, but are also making changes, they will sometimes introduce a change that does not comport with what they've copied out. Um, they create a narrative inconsistency. And this consistently happens with Matthew and Luke's use of Mark. That is, Matthew and Luke will make a characteristic change to Mark and then lapse back into Mark's verbatim wording, thereby producing an inconsistency. Another argument from Mark Goodacre, fatigue in the synoptics. Great examples of this um, include uh, Luke, as all Christians have recognized forever, rearranges the stories of Jesus he gets from Mark, moves them into different places, different settings. Um, there's a shuffling. I mean, Luke tells us this in the prologue. Um, he's putting this, he's received these stories and he's putting them in a proper order. Taxus, taxus. Um, this is something Luke tells us in the prologue that he's doing. He's rearranging the stories. Uh, he rearranges the feeding um, 
in Bethsaida, I mean, uh, sorry, the feeding of the 5,000 from Mark happens in a deserted place, happens in a desert. And the disciples say, for we are here in a deserted place, where shall they get food? Takes that, relocates it in a city in Bethsaida. But copies over the disciples saying, we are here in a deserted place. But in Luke, they're not. In Luke, they're in a, they're in a village because Luke has rearranged this narrative. Characteristic change, laps back into the wording of a source. We see that happening also uh, with Matthew and uh, his depiction of Herod. Um, Matthew makes Herod more villainous. He tells us from the beginning. So in Mark, uh, Herod kind of likes Jesus. Um, and then uh, um, gives this uh, promise to Salome that he will give her whatever she asks for. And she asks for, um, prompted by her mother, asks for the head of John the Baptist. And Herod is sad. Herod doesn't want to kill John the Baptist because, as, as Mark told us already, Herod likes John the Baptist. Um, he thinks he's interesting. He's kind of perplexed by him. There's some, there's some conflict. Um, but we get this depiction, a plausible depiction of Herod as um, liking John the Baptist, being forced into this, and then we're told at the end of the story that Herod is sad about having to kill him. Matthew, throughout the whole gospel, heightens the conflicts between Jesus and the leadership. This is a theme of Matthew. Um, constantly heightening the conflict. And one of the things he does is he takes out this initial sympathetic detail about Herod. And he says instead that Herod didn't like John the Baptist all along. But preserves, copies it of Mark verbatim, Herod being sad when he has to kill John. But it doesn't make sense in Matthew by itself. In Matthew, you have to ask yourself, why would Herod be sad? We've, he finally has an excuse to kill John. That's something he's wanted to do from the beginning. Well, it makes sense if Matthew and Luke are rewriting are, are rewriting the Gospel of Mark. Mm, I wonder if there's anything with Pontius Pilate. I just, you brought that up and it made me think of him because in, from historical writings outside of the Gospels, yep. the dude was definitely not a cool guy to the Jews. That's right. But he's super cool with Jesus, you know? Yeah, he's, co he's a complicated figure, of course. Um, <laughs> but but yes, he is relatively know. sympathetic. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure how to fit that into, I'm not considered that in light of editorial fatigue and the use of the Gospels. Any, yep. The, the last thing is this micro-conflation argument, um, which is uh, historians in antiquity don't micro-conflate sources. That is, they don't take two sources and interweave them in detailed ways. This is probably partially because of how they use technology. You know, you've got a big book roll, you're copying it on your knee. It's really hard to compare two texts in a way that allows you to c combine word-for-word -word passages. And so you can look across studies of Plutarch, studies of Livy. Um, you can look across how ancient historians handled their texts. And what you, what you see is they copy and they, they work in blocks. And this is typical. Um, uh, same thing for the record uh, is true of if Luke is using Mark he, he, and Matthew or Mark and Q, he seems to be working in blocks for the most part. Um, but if Mark is using Matthew and Luke, which is the opposite theory. If Mark and Priority is not true, he's using Matthew and Luke. He has to have m conflated Matthew and Luke in a way that we don't see anyone else in antiquity doing. Um, and I think in a way that's really, really implausible based are on there everything. Any scholars right now that are serious that actually take that position? That left. Um, there are not scholars anymore, as far as I'm aware, who are publishing on the synoptic problem who accept uh, Mark and posteriority. There are a few people who work in biblical studies generally, who don't publish on the synoptic problem usually, who still accept Mark and posteriority. And they do so on the basis of Christian tradition. Because, of course, um, there developed early on a tradition that Matthew is the first gospel written by the disciple Matthew, right. and Mark was a hearer of Peter. And, P and Papias talks yep. about this, yeah. Yeah, although Papias here is actually not entirely clear that that's what's happening. Papias may even know of Mark and priority. If you go read how that's working, at least that's the order in which he presents the things. Um, but that's a, um, and possibly his comment about what Matthew is doing is assuming use of Mark. Possibly. That's a controversial, difficult claim. Um, but no, the, the, the Mark and Prioritists, um, which is the, sorry, Mark and Posteriority, the people who deny Mark and Priority, priority were called the Griesbachians. Um, and most of the Griesbachians uh, have now died off. Um, there was a scholar named William Farmer in the 1960s who had a brief, like, tried to resurrect this view, and he had a couple followers. Um, but I think the last followers of Farmer, um, the disciples of Farmer, so to speak, uh, are gone. And so 
no, today um, you can find theologians who will accept Methine priority, um, and that's fine. Uh, but you don't find people who work, study the Gospels closely, who work on the synoptic problem, who deny Markan priority. Interesting. Very interesting. There's so many questions that could get in, like delve into, and there's so much written on the topic. Mm -hmm. Of course, Dr. Goodacre, I plan on getting him on for the Gospel of Thomas soon, but um, you know, you you definitely kind of painted that really easy for people to see. So if you didn't know, now you do have an idea yep. what the scholarship thinks on this topic. Thank you so much. Man. Absolutely. Yeah, Appreciate my it. pleasure. Ha, 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 ha,